uh, it's always nice to have people in. It's not good to preach to pews or speak to pews. My wife doesn't like this joke, but I've never gotten a pew to move, you know. Of course, there's a lot of Baptists I haven't gotten to move either, amen. Look at me, please. We're going to have a theme verse for this. We're going to start off, obviously, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, if you would, please. This particular verse we will deal with tonight. It, it, it is extremely important. Um, let me lay a little bit of background on it first. The word church is used in the New Testament. The word, uh, the Greek word, which is the word ekklesia, um, is used between 116 and 119 times. Um, this is the first use right here. First time it's used is right here, Matthew chapter 16. So that's important. It's very, very important. It, it sets down a lot of things. It's, it's called the principle of first use. So if, if it, when it's used the first time, you got to pay attention to it because it's something that's important. Okay? And I want you to see it in verse number 16. It says, and Simon Peter answered. Now, let's go back up to, to verse 15. He, that being Christ, saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? So he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And here's their reply. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Now he goes on to say, And I say also unto, unto thee, Thou art Peter. The word Peter comes from the word Petra. It means a small stone, a pebble, something along those lines, a very little rock. And it says, And upon this rock, not referring to Peter, but the statement of Peter, okay? You got to be careful about that because there are those who believe that he's talking about Peter here and that Peter is the foundation of the church. No, no. He, the, the foundation of the church is the statement Peter made because that word rock there is referring to a boulder, huge, large, okay? And the, the, word, the word Peter comes from the word Petra, and it means a little pebble, and that's Peter. If anybody was a little pebble and got in the way of things, it was Peter. Amen. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for this time. Help my mind to be clear. Help me be able to present it the way you would have it presented. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just deal with each and every one of us. Lord God, it is important. History is so important. And Lord God, help us to realize how we got here and to be careful where we're going. Thank you for your blessings now in Jesus' name. Amen. Here is the question. If Jesus started a church, which one is it? I mean, it's just logical. Which one? Now, it's real, it's real simple to be able to rule out some that he didn't start. If a man other than Christ, is the starter of that denomination inside the so-called umbrella of Christianity, then that's not the church that Jesus started, okay? Now, you say, what are you talking about? Well, listen to this. The Methodists were started by the Wesley brothers. The Presbyterians were started by John Calvin. The Lutherans were started by Martin Luther and Zwingle. The Church of England was started by King James of England. The Church of Christ was started by Alexander Campbell. The Mormons were started by Joseph Smith. The Mennonites, Amish, Church of God, Assemblies of God, which they were started in the Azusa Street Revival in 1909. Bible churches, which are split from the Presbyterian churches. Four Square Gospel, which is a split from the Assemblies of God. Evangelical Free Churches, well, I don't know where they come from. I'm sorry, I really have no idea. The Cowboy Churches and in, tu in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they even have a Guts Church. Now, it's sorry, that's the name of the church. It's called the Guts Church. That's stupid. You know, and their motto, of course, is you've got to have guts to go here. Oh, that's just absolutely dumb. You say, is that their motto? I don't know, but it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> now, since these churches with inside the realm of what is called Christianity, since these denominations are started by some particular man in a place in history, and 
All of these that I have named were started from the 1500s on. So that's at least, at least 1470 years before, after Christ said this. Okay? So they cannot be his church. No. They cannot be. Why? Because we have somebody else who started it, not Christ. So we can count them out right now. They're out, they're out the door. That's it. You say, well, you know, wait, wait a minute. No, 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 wait a minute. We're looking for, who did he start? I mean, which church is his? And therefore, if some man started it, other than him, then it's not his. You know, it's just logical. Now, there are two groups Two denominations that I did not mention. One, of course, is the Baptist. Anybody catch who the other one is? Anybody know? Come on, somebody give me somebody else. What, what, what was the other group, the other denomination? Huh? Now, Jehovah Witnesses, they're, they're out in left field somewhere. I, they were started by Smith and who did, I, who did I not? That's exactly right, the Catholic Church. You have two that can claim they're started by Christ, the Baptists and the Catholics. Now, how do I find which one is real, which one isn't? Amen? Now, there, uh, and we'll get into this in just a bit. There are several theories that are presented by the Protestant movement to make them part of the church that Jesus started. They have several theories that they put in. One is called the church branch theory, okay? What that means is you, you have a, 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 a tree, okay, and it has roots, and a tree grows up, and as the tree grows up, it branches out, right? Okay, so, and if you've ever studied any kind of church history, you will see a tree used in this way. And they'll say, okay, over here we got the Presbyterians, and over here we got the Methodists, and then the Lutherans are this branch, and the Baptists are over here, and the Catholics are over here. It's called the church branch theory, okay? Now, there's one problem with this theory. Since none of these groups agree doctrinally, then you're telling me that this tree in its branches produces different wood. Since that's the theory, you say, what are you talking about? Well, I don't know about you. I, I'm a city boy. I was raised in the city. I don't know anything about farming except what little I learned as a pastor in Iowa, and people still laugh at me because I did not know what a steer was till I was 27 years old. Okay? Now, see, you, you laughed at me. You, you did. I didn't. Hey, I'll tell you what. You turn me loose in the country, and I will die. You put me in the woods, I have no idea. But I'll take you downtown Detroit, Chicago, Boston, or New York, and we'll see how you do. Amen? That's what I grew up in. It's what I know. Well, we had almost as much grass as this pew in our place. And, and I do not understand the principle of a small city. The apartment complex I grew up in, or one of the one, major ones that I was in before I graduated from high school, had 3,500 people in the apartment complex. I go through a city, I go through a city of 500, and I think, why? Because I don't, I don't comprehend. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me, okay? You need to understand that. I'm, I am a pure city boy. Through and through, I, I get it. I understand that. And you say, hey, 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 bunch of city boys. Yeah, that's all right. You're a bunch of hicks. <laughs> so we got you coming and going. All right. Now, I know this, I learned this, okay, that if you plant an oak tree, you get oak. Not elm or pine, you get oak. You know, when I was in Iowa, I learned this, that if you put corn in the ground, soybeans is not coming up. Corn is coming up because that's what you planted. If you have a tree that's an oak tree, its branches are going to be oak. So how in the world can we use this church branch theory 
to make everybody fit together. Well, it doesn't work. It's an excuse to include groups that know they're not included. That's all it is. They have the second one, and the second one is called the army theory, the church army theory. Well, we're one great big army. I don't know about you, but it appears that this army spends a lot of time fighting with each other. And the tactics that are used in one of these groups is not the same as the tactics used in another of these groups. Uh, it, it would be like sending an army out to war and, and each one of their platoons would say, well, we're going to do it our way. Well, that's not going to go well. It has to be a coordinated attack with basic laws and principles that are taught to the whole army. Everybody has their place, their situation. Amen? That's the way it is. Well, that doesn't work either. So they come up with another idea. And the idea is what's called the universal invisible church. Now, the Catholic Church believes in a universal, visible church, okay? Well, since they broke away from Catholicism and they didn't want to hold to several of the things of Catholicism, they used what is called a universal, invisible church theory, okay? So they believe that everybody is saved into the church or the body. That's what they believe. Now, there's a lot of problems with this. You see, because my Bible says... That in the New Testament church, you're supposed to bring your tithes to the New Testament church. And if I'm in a universal church, I don't know where they meet. Yeah, it's, it's invisible. You know, I've never seen a universal, invisible church ever ordain a missionary, take up an offering, hold a service, any of the things that the church is supposed to do. And so they say, well, you're one of those Baptists. Yeah, I am. I am one of those Baptists. And you believe that each local New Testament church is a body of Christ. Yeah, I do. I believe that. That's what the Bible teaches. Yeah, but what about Ephesians chapter 4? It says one body, and you got a bunch of different bodies of Christ. Okay, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm laying the groundwork for where we're going to ultimately end up. Uh, and, and I hate to do this, and, but you, you have to lay groundwork. You, you have to lay a good foundation or you end up in the wrong place. Hey, amen, right, right? If you don't put a good foundation on the building, the building's going to fall down. So Ephesians chapter number 4, this is the verse they run to. And I always get a big chuckle because I'm waiting for them to run there. Okay, you want to go there? Good. You go there and we're going to have fun with you. Okay? Listen to what it says. This is where they go. They go to verse number four. There is one body. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, to see, you can't have all those bodies around. You know, this church can't be a body, and that church can't be a body. The other, and that's their, that's their idea. Okay. All right. If you want to believe this, then you are lost. Because. I'm saved, which means that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, and he indwells me. Do you believe that? Okay. Then, since there's one body, and there's only one spirit, and since I have him, you can. So, wait a minute. No, 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 no. If you're going to hold to one thing, you got to hold to another thing. That's exactly right. You can't, you can't, you, you know, we don't adjust it as we go on the fly here. You say, well, preacher, preacher, you, you're missing the point here. You're missing the point because, see, the Holy Spirit can indwell me and can indwell you. But there's only one spirit. Doesn't it say that? It, the next verses say one spirit. So you explain to me how we can do that. If I'm going to hold to the one thing, I must hold to the other thing. And since all the other stuff with the universal church doesn't fit together, this doesn't fit together. And, and here, is, here is what's absolutely interesting involved with it. Uh, <laughs> this is by, okay, I, I'm, I'm making, I'm rattling noise here, and I'm going to try to get this where you don't have to listen to the popping and all that other kind of stuff. This is by uh, a Bishop D.S. Doggett. He is a Methodist preacher, and this is in the Methodist Quarterly. Here's what he said. 
we must conclude that things equal to or like the same thing are equal to or like each other. What? He's saying the same thing is the same thing, okay? If this is like this, then they are the same thing. And then he goes on. In other words, if it is his church, it will look like what he built. Otherwise, it is not his church. Well, that makes sense to me. Yeah, this is a, this is a Methodist preacher who said this in the Methodist quarter, quarterly, and the guy's name is Doggett. And he made the statement back in the 1900s, if it doesn't look like what he built, then it's not his. Wow. Well, well, I agree with him. Yeah. I like that. I think he's right. And guess what, Mr. Doggett? The Methodists don't look like the church that Jesus built. Amen. So, therefore, I have to conclude that the Methodists are not his. It is really, I love it when guys kill themselves. Amen. We come back to the Catholics and the Baptists. So, which one did Jesus start? And this is where it becomes interesting because you determine that by doctrine. In other words, what did Jesus teach? What he taught is what his church will believe, right? That's his church. It will believe what he taught. Okay. All right. Pretty simple. It makes good sense that his church will believe what he taught. So what did he teach? Amen. He taught the issue. See, this, this is... This is where it's really important. You need to understand, this is why God has his word. That's why that Bible is so important. And when people say to you, well, you know what? We don't need to haggle over doctrine. You know what doctrine means? It means right teaching. We don't need to haggle over right teaching. We need to, haggle, we, we need to all believe false things. I, we had a really interesting thing. Uh, happened at our church when I was pastoring in Dubuque. They back in the '90s they had these walks for Jesus. I don't know if any, if any of you remember. Had these walks for Jesus, okay? And all across the country on the same day, people would walk for Jesus. So they sent this lady to talk to me to get me involved. And, they, and it was a non-denomination, non-denominational Christian, whatever. So this lady came and sat down in my office, and she said, we'd like to invite your church to go on the walk for Jesus on Saturday and such and such a day. I said, okay, okay. I have a question, okay. As we're doing the walk for Jesus, are we going to pass out tracts? Seems logical to me. Pass out some tracts. Oh, no, 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 that might offend somebody. Okay. Are we going to sing gospel songs? No, 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 that might offend somebody. When we get to our destination in the park, are we going to have some preaching and offer the issue of salvation? She said, no, 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 that, that might offend somebody. I said, ma'am, Jesus couldn't be in your walk for Jesus. Yeah. 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 I said, you know, he, he couldn't walk with you. He, he, he'd have to refuse to be in the walk for Jesus because that's what he would do. Yeah. Amen. The, he'd be witnessing and preaching. Amen. I, I, I don't understand. That's people, you know, they try to make everything religious and who knows what's going on. It's just craziness. So we have the two groups. Now the question is, and a lot of people have made the uh, assumption, they have said that a man named John Smythe started the Baptist in 1610 in England. Okay. They say, oh, that's when the Baptist started. Well, you, you got a couple, you got two problems with that. Number one, John Smythe died in 1608. He wasn't alive in 1610. And also, John Smythe did not die in England. He died in Norway. Hmm. And Baptists were reported in Germany in 1525, and also in Norway in 1495, and also, you keep going backwards, you'll find them reported in France in 1000 AD. So th that doesn't add up. So they try to say, well, that's when the Baptist started. Well, that doesn't, historically speaking, that doesn't work. 
So we come back to these two groups. All right, let's look at the doctrinal statements of the two and compare it with the Bible. The Catholic Church believes in infant baptism, sprinkling, for the removal of original sin. It's not biblical. The Catholic Church believes that Mary is the mother of God and the mediatrix. It's not biblical. The Catholic Church believes that you have to keep the seven sacraments to get to heaven. That's not biblical. The Catholic Church believes in penance. It's not biblical. The Catholic Church believes that the priest can remove your sin. It's not biblical. You see, we, we have a real problem here. See, that's why God made sure his Bible stuck around. Amen. Because that way, you can look at it and they, somebody says, well, this is what we believe. You're going, well, that's not what that says. Yeah. So, and the Baptists believe in salvation by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Isn't it interesting that everything we believe, you got a verse for it? Yeah. Or a lot of verses for it? Yeah. Okay. I say you're still with me, right? Still, we're still on the same course all together. Okay, so doctrine has concluded it. Now, let's look at this issue of the church quickly so that we can get into some of the history. The word church in the New Testament, as I said, is used between 116 and 119 times. It is the word ekklesia. Now, sometimes you'll find it spelled E-K-K or E-C-C. I don't know. I think E-K-K is the Greek, and it really doesn't matter. Okay, it's used all of these times in the Bible. The modern Protestant movement says that the definition of the word ecclesia is called out ones. That's not the definition. The definition of the word ecclesia is called out assembly. And if you'll notice in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my church. That word ecclesia was used on a regular basis referring to all sorts of assemblies. And I'll prove it to you. Go with me to Acts chapter number 19. Acts chapter number 19. It's amazing how God puts these things in the word of God. If you, if you study, you'd be surprised how much you'd learn. In Acts chapter number 19, the Apostle Paul has done preaching. He's preaching in Ephesus, and people get mad because people are getting saved, and the, the guys who make the little statues and the statue of Diana are losing money. That's the way it always is. Come on, okay? It always comes down to money. And so they're losing, so they get a big uproar. And they're, oh, man, he's, in, he's decrying our goddess Diana. Oh, we need to get him, and we need to burn him at the stake or whatever. And so they gather him up, and they and the, the magistrates of the city, they come out and say, what are you doing? You know, and they, they calm everybody down. Now, I want you to see in verse number 32. It said, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. You see that word assembly? It is the word ecclesia. It's the same word that Jesus used in Matthew 16, verse number 18. It's the exact same word. Now, so this assembly has gotten together. Now go down to verse number 39. So, so we know in verse number 32, it's not talking about a New Testament church, is it? It's talking about all them people who, who are together at that particular point. In verse number 39, it says, But if ye inquire anything concerning our other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. It's the same word. Hmm. And then look at verse number 41. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Same word. All three times in Acts chapter 19 that it's used, it is not referring to a local New Testament church. It is referring to a group of people who have gotten together. And when they came together, they were called an ecclesia. An assembly. Jesus said, I will build my church. He distinguished the assembly by the word my. This belongs to me. This is mine. Possession. 
So in reference to a church, it is that which assembles and belongs to him. That's a church. If it doesn't assemble, it's not a church. And if it doesn't fit according to what he taught, it's not his. Two things. Kick him right out of the way. Now, let me say something right here. Stop it right here for a minute. If you have a question, you just raise your hand. I'll answer your question, okay? It doesn't throw me off. I have a tendency to, I'm, I'm told I'm fast on my feet. I'm, I, I got nothing else, folks. I got a big mouth and a, and, and a quick sense and, I, and a quick quib. If you don't believe me, ask my children and, and my wife. But uh, so if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask it, okay? I don't want to leave you out in the dark. So the next question comes into being is when did the church start? Okay, so now we know what a church is. When did it start? That's a logical question. So a church is a called out assembly, right? And it's his church. And you notice what he says in Matthew chapter 16. He says, I will build my church. You see the word build there? That word build is translated in other portions of the scripture to edify. The word edify means to build up. Did you notice it doesn't mean to start? It doesn't mean to start. It's not a future tense idea in that, well, it's gonna, uh, I will build it sometime in the future. No. You know what he's saying? I'm, I'm going to build up my church. That's right. It's already here. So what are you talking about? Well, in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke chapter 4, Jesus had come out of the wilderness. And he went by a couple of fishermen who had been baptized by John the Baptist, which means that they showed a issue of repentance and faith in a coming Messiah. And they'd been scripturally baptized by John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist had scriptural baptism. That mattered. Jesus walked 70 miles to be baptized of John the Baptist. And if it mattered to him, it should matter to us. Amen. So here it is. And he went by these fishermen. He said, follow me. And so they left their nets. Amen. Right? And they followed him. And then he went to a tax collector and he said, follow me. And he did too. He'd been baptized by John the Baptist. In fact, he called out these guys, all of these guys. And you know what they did? They assembled together. That sounds like a church to me. Here, not only that, they had a treasurer. Okay, the guy was a schmuck. Okay, we know that. Okay, he was, he, he, yeah, he's a lost man. But our, our, all of our churches have had lost people in it. So that's, you know, Jesus can have lost people. We can have lost people too. But we, he, they got a treasurer. Amen. They went on visitation. Didn't they? He sent them out. He sent out the, the two by two with the 12. He sent them out with the 70. Amen. He sent them out. In Acts chapter 1, they held a business meeting. Amen. They are a functioning body. And they had a pastor who preached to them and taught them. And his name was Jesus Christ. He called himself the great shepherd. Do you know the word shepherd? comes from the Greek word episkopos, which is the word that we translate in other places, pastor. Huh. You say, when did the church start? Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. It's a, historically, it's the same time point. They called them out. They assembled. It's a church. They got a pastor. They got a treasurer. They got preaching and teaching. They got visitation program. They hold a business meeting. And people say, well, no, 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 the church didn't start till Acts chapter number 2. They go, oh, Acts chapter 2, that's when the church started. Well, here's the problem. Nowhere in Acts chapter 2 does it say the church started. Did you know that? You read the whole chapter, nowhere. The thing it does say in Acts chapter 2, that they were added unto the church daily, such as should be saved. They were added to. 
You got to have something in existence to add it to it. It didn't start in Acts chapter 2. But you know what? We're going to have a universal church. We got to move things around a little bit so we can get our theology in here. No, 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 no. We're going to have to believe what the Bible says. And this is what the Bible says. It's very simple. It's very easy. It, you know what? If somebody like me can get it, anybody can get it. Amen. It's just real simple. It's, it's not hard. It's not hard at all. And that's, that's, what, that's what bothers me. These people go to colleges and seminaries, and they learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew, and they come out dumber than they went in. And I don't understand what happened. Amen. You know, education made them fools. So here comes the next thing. Why are we called Baptists? Because in the New Testament, the churches are called the church at. Right? Church at Antioch, church at Corinth, church at Galatia, or the churches of Galatia, I should say, a uh, church at Rome. They're called the church at, right? They're not called Baptists. How did that happen? What took place there? And I'm going to jump ahead, and then I'm going to come back. Okay, you with me? So I'm going to jump ahead to a time period when we got our name because we didn't choose the name. The name was thrust upon us. We were just the church at. In 250 A.D., and I'm hoping to get there tonight, um, there was a split that took place. And it's really where the Roman Catholic Church began. The roots of the Roman Catholic Church started 250 A.D. That really culminated in about 313 with Constantine. And the group split off for some serious doctrinal reasons. And I'll get to it. Please bear with me, okay? And the group that went into false doctrine, you had the other group over here that weren't in false doctrine. And these churches had a belief together. Well, when this church went into false doctrine, these churches would not accept their baptism. So this group here, which later became called Catholics, began to call these group of churches Anna Baptists. Anna meaning re, re-baptizers. Now, we didn't believe that. We said... You see, now remember, the Catholic Church immersed for a baptism at its beginning. Okay? It didn't, sprinkling didn't come along until four or 500 A.D., somewhere near. I'll get more into that um, tomorrow night. But here's, here's the thing. The authority to baptize belongs to the New Testament church. The commission in Matthew chapter 28 belongs to the New Testament church. It wasn't given to just the apostles. It was given to the church. It was given to the apostles. It died with the apostles. But by giving it to the church, and the church is in perpetuity, which means it continues on until Christ comes, okay? In perpetuity, thereby, that commission, which was given in Matthew 28, is our commission, too. It applies to us. Amen? Right? Doesn't that, the Great Commission is an application to this church here and to the church I'm a member of? Amen. So the commission is given to the New Testament church, not to individuals, because it would have died with those individuals. It was given to the New Testament church, which has continued on. Like Jesus said, gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. It's going to be here till he gets back. Okay? Now, it may be in caves, but it's going to be here. So, if this, I just lost my train of thought. You know, I hate that when it happens. I lost my train, and my notes are up there with my glasses. I have no idea where I was at, what I was thinking of, but it's gone. It's gone. It's just absolutely gone. I hate that when that happens. Don't you hate that when that happens? You do. I do, too. Okay, so, these churches split. We became called Anabaptists, rebaptizers. You see, the only one that has the authority to baptize is a scriptural New Testament church. And if you were baptized, you see, there there are three things that are required for baptism. Number one, you got to be saved. If you're not saved, 
It's not baptism. Okay. If you were dunked before you were saved, then you were dunked. You had a bath. Okay. The second thing that is required is the mode. It has to be by immersion. Sprinkling is not baptism. Since Romans says, ye are buried in baptism. And I don't know about you, but when somebody dies, I'm not going to sprinkle a handful of dirt on him and walk away and leave that guy laying there because he's going to stink. Amen. We're going to put him in the ground. And Romans chapter 7, you are buried in baptism. Amen. Okay, so you have to be, so you have to have the right candidate. You have to have the right mode. And then you have to have the right authority. Who has the right to baptize? If the commission is to the New Testament church that Jesus started, then the only one that has the right to baptize is his churches. Nobody else. See, I don't, I don't have the right to go out and baptize anybody I feel like. Mm -mm. Because then baptism would hinge on whether I was saved or not. What if I went out and baptized a bunch of people and then afterwards got saved? Were they baptized? According to the theology of these individuals. What if I never got saved and they didn't know it? See, but if it belongs to the authority of the New Testament church, then you can count on your baptism being right. And you don't have to worry about the guy who does the dunking. Amen. Okay? If he's saved or lost, praise the Lord. You, you hope he's saved. Amen? Yeah. But if he's not... That doesn't matter because the authority lies in the New Testament church. What matters is, was I baptized by a scriptural New Testament church? And if not, then I'm not baptized. Well, that's going to cause all kinds of problems right there. You know, we, just, we just created a mess, didn't we? Yeah, it's terrible. And I'm sorry, but this is just the way it is. So the name originally, Anabaptist, was a derogatory name towards us. And it carried through the centuries. Ultimately, the Anna was dropped, and they were just called Baptists. And that's what we were called. And that's where our name came from. Now, jumping back, and hopefully I can get to 250 AD. Oh, man, alive. I, I have promised myself that I would not take you too long so that I would not bore you to death. So if it gets to be too long, you wave your arm, and I'll look the other way, okay? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I didn't see anything. As you can see, this is huge to me. I, it's really important. I love it. it is, and I believe it's important to the church today because we are being so much inundated yeah. with joining up with everybody that we are losing who we are. You see... Uh, uh, years back, when I was younger, they, you, you, did you hear the fundamentalists? You know, people call themselves fundamentalists. Did you hear that? It was very popular. Some of you are old enough to remember that. It was very, very popular back in the 60s and 70s. Well, we're fundamentalists. Okay, that's, that sounds real good. And I believe in the fundamentals of the scripture. But I'm not a fundamentalist. You see, fundamentalism is a movement. And movements come and go. I'm a Baptist, which is a distinctive. You say to somebody, I'm a Baptist. And you know, they say, oh, you're one of them. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I am. I'm one of them. Amen. Glory to God. I don't have a problem with that. Amen. It's like, let, let's relate it to something else in history. The British came over here and uh, during the Revolutionary War. They called the soldiers by a derogatory term. They called them Yankees. And they made a song of Yankee Doodle came to town riding on a pony. It was a derogatory term. And when the revolutionary people defeated the British, they told them the Yankees have come. It became, they started as a derogatory term and became a badge of honor. Of course, now, if you're a New York Yankee fan, that doesn't apply to at you at all. But this is where this idea comes from. It's the same thing. They gave it to us as a derogatory term, but it has now come to mean something way more than that. And it is important. It is a distinctive. It sets us apart from all other groups. And that is important. You see, I'm not a Protestant. I didn't protest the, the, the Catholic Church. I wasn't part of it. 
We've never been in it. They left us. We're not part of them. So we're not Protestants. So don't let anybody convince you of that. Don't let anybody tell you that. It's just wrong. So let's go and let's look at the first century. Okay? Go to the first century. And if you read the book of Acts, you know how things proceeded. Uh, <laughs> Jesus said to go into the uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Well, folks were getting saved in Jerusalem. And the church, they say the church may have gotten to as big as 100,000 people. I don't know. I have no idea. There's, it's interesting that a number is never given on the size of a church. The only one that we have is in Acts chapter number 1 when it says 120 met together in the upper room. That's it. How big was the church at Antioch? I don't know. How big was the church at Corinth? I don't know. How big was the church at Thessalonica? I don't know. Why? Because the Bible doesn't say. Because the church is not counted by numbers. Well, Jesus told him to go out and preach the gospel. Well, you know what? Things are going so good in Jerusalem, and all these Jews are getting saved, and they really like it, and they're rejoicing around, the, and they got the temple, and they're waiting for the Lord to come back, and they know he's coming back, and they're not getting out and witnessing to anybody. So persecution started. Acts chapter 8. Let me say this to you. If we won't get out and do it, Jesus will bring uh, the issues along for us to get us out and do it. He's not going to, we're not going to lay around and do nothing. He won't be happy with that. So, you know what it says? They scattered and they went preaching. And folks got saved. Churches got started. One in Samaria, one in Antioch. And now the apostles are saying, we got to go check this out, make sure these are good churches and are scriptural. And that's what they did. And so the churches began to spread. And then in Acts chapter number 9, this little fellow who was extremely intense and very, very smart, well-trained, well-taught, a Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as he claimed, and God met him on a road, Damascus, and saved his soul. Amen. You know, he was convicted by Stephen, who he was the one responsible for having him stoned to death. He'd gone about beating other Christians, putting them in prison, and even killing them. And so he had quite the reputation. And it wasn't, good. It wasn't a good one amongst the Christians. And so now... He's in Damascus, and, G, and the, the Lord comes to a, a guy named Annas and says to him, says, uh, <clears throat> I want you to go to Damascus. There's a fellow there named Saul, and I want you to baptize him. And Annas said, uh, Lord, don't you know who he is? You know, that is really a stupid question. But it is what he said. And he says, he is a chosen vessel unto me. I've got a great work for him. And he went, baptized him. He has his training, and then he teams up with a man named Barnabas, and they start out. A little bit later, a man named Silas, Acts chapter 16. Probably the greatest missionary. Never had cell phones, internet, cars. Never had any of those things. He walked from place to place. Wrote half of the New Testament and churches were started and began to flourish all throughout the Roman Empire. Well, the Romans viewed the churches as part of Judaism. They really did. They stunned, they, they stunned, since Judaism was a legal religion in, in Rome, that was fine. So the Judaizers came into the churches trying to convince these Gentiles, because a lot of Gentiles were getting saved, and convince these Gentiles that they should convert to Judaism, and then they've got to be circumcised and all this other kind of nonsense. And Paul goes ballistic on this in the book of Galatians, ends up going back to the church of Jerusalem and says, hey, this is not right. We couldn't keep the law, and now we're making them keep the law? And they said, uh, you're right. Well, Paul, you go preach to the Gentiles, and Peter, he'll preach to the Jews. 
And later on, when the situation comes up with Paul and Peter uh, separates himself from the Gentiles in, in, the, in the church meeting over by the Jews. And Paul gets up in the middle of the meeting, and here's this little short man. Peter is, appears to be a rather big fella, and this little bitty short guy who appears to have bad eyesight, uh, uh, and again, that's just a supposition, uh, goes over to Paul and chews him out publicly. And later on, Peter makes a statement in, the, in his writings. He said, and the, the apostle Paul, whom sa who says some very hard things. Yeah, Peter, he said them to you. Amen. I like that. I, that my kind of guy. Amen. Amen. I like that. He wasn't going to back down to anybody. What's right is what's right, no matter who it is. Paul ended up in Rome, as you know. The last writing he has is 2 Timothy. Okay, that's the last of his books that he wrote to the young preacher boy. He is brought up and examined by Caesar. Do you know who the Caesar is? He's Nero. Nero is a nut. This guy is crazy. You study history, and he is an absolute. The old statement of Nero fiddling why Rome burned. Well, he blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians when he actually started it because he wanted to make Rome into a much more beautiful city, so he burned down half of it. He's the one who had Paul put to death. Now, Romans chapter 13 is written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. And that church at Rome is under Caesar. And it says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. Paul instructed the Christians to obey the laws of of Rome until they cross the line to God. And Rome was not a democratic society. It was run by an absolute crazy man at that time. So whenever you think that we should go and overthrow the government and all that kind of stuff, just remember what Romans 13 has to say. Mm -hmm. I know I have a hard time with it too but it is what the Bible says and we're gonna, if we're going to talk about it we're going to have to believe what the Bible says so regardless listen I'll make a, a statement here America is the greatest country to ever exist did you know that you say well, well, well wait, wait, the, the, how, how can you say that do you know in her 200 and almost 250 years of existence, almost 250 years of existence, America has sent out more missionaries to preach the gospel than all other nations combined all the way back to the time of Christ. One nation. We have sent out more missionaries than all the other nations combined to the, back to the time of Christ. You want to know why this country is so great? Because she honored God. I just get a big chuckle. Out and it's, you know, the theme of the now present president is make America great again. Well, you know what? God made America great, and only God can make it great again. Not some president. And until we bow the knee and repent, until we turn from our unrighteousness, it's just going to get worse. And I weep for our children and grandchildren because she's going downhill. And the only thing that's made us great is God. And if we lose him, the greatness is gone. All right. That's my preaching for tonight. No, no I'm not done with my lesson. That's my preaching for tonight, okay? Just wanted to make sure you understood that. Uh, I have uh, some other things that I want to put forth in here. Now, let me give you something. So the first century, you got these Roman emperors. Some of them would persecute the Christians, and some of them wouldn't. So there would be a time of persecution, and then that emperor would die or be assassinated. Being an emperor in Rome, you didn't live real long. Okay, Somebody was bound and determined to kill you. Okay, And which always, I, I was always perplexed when I studied history. Um, you know, so... Your pastor's the emperor, 
and I want to be the emperor. So I get some guys together, and we kill him, and I become the emperor. Well, logically speaking, aren't there some guys getting together to kill me? Yeah. I, I'm not sure this would be a position I would really want because they didn't last real long. Some of them only lasted a couple of years. Some of them went as long as 15 years, things like that. But they didn't. They, there was a lot of secession, and it wasn't because they retired. It was because somebody killed them. So I'm not sure I would want this. So, so it depends upon the emperor. Some of the emperors uh, would persecute the Christians severely, throw them to the lions and, and have them torn apart. And then some of them would just say, I'm not going to waste my time with them. So one of the emperors, he sent out one of his guys to, uh, um, how, do I, how do I put it? He wanted to know about this Christianity. So he sent out one of his writers, and this is actually kept in the, in the pages of uh, uh, Roman writings. Here's what this guy, and it, I have no idea what the guy's name is, and it's in the second century, so it's after 100 A.D. It, in his conclusion about the Christians, okay, these were the best of people, hardworking, law-abiding, tax-paying citizens, willing to be excellent subjects to their ruler. And he concluded with this, they must be eradicated, for they will ultimately destroy the Roman Empire. It sounded pretty good to me. I mean, you know, hey, law-abiding, they pay their taxes, they obey the laws. We've got to get rid of these people because this, this isn't going to work because if you have honest people, the Roman Empire is going down the tubes. Back in those days with the emperors, the centurion who was the commander of a hundred soldiers. This, is, this story takes place around 140 A.D., 150 A.D. And every year the centurions were required to come in and bow down and kiss the ring of the emperor and declare him to be God, his God, and that he would serve him unquestioning. Okay? Well, a lot of soldiers had gotten saved. And this one centurion had gotten saved. And it came time for him to come in and bow down and kiss the ring of the, the emperor and declare this. And he came to the emperor and he told him, I will follow your orders, I will keep your commands, but you are not my God. And he testified to this man about his salvation. The emperor became furious. It was cold, it was winter time. So he took the man with his hundred soldiers and he started a fire. And it was freezing cold and the, the lake was frozen over. They stripped the man of all his clothes and they told him, if you'll come back, we're going to put you out on the ice, if you'll come back and kiss my ring and declare that I'm your God, you can live. So they took him out on the ice and they left him out there. And the soldiers, his hundred soldiers, stood around. While out there, the man began to sing the book of Psalms. And he sang the book of Psalms. His soldiers stripped their clothes, ran out to their centurion, and died with him. These are our people. There was a man named Polycarp. He was trained by the Apostle John. Polycarp had been in church apparently most all of his life, got saved at a young age, somewhere around 8 to 10 years old. The, the Apostle John was the man who trained him. The emperor decided it was time for him to make a show of Christianity and to get rid of the Christians. So they went and got the most renowned of all the preachers, and it was Polycarp. And Polycarp was like 94, 96 years old. In bringing him to the emperor, the soldiers went in, and in dragging him out of the house, they broke his leg. And they still dragged him and stood him up before the emperor on a broken leg. And the emperor said, you need to bow down to me, and if, you, and if you're not willing to do that, we're, we're going to burn you at stake. And Polycarp said, you know, all these years, he has been faithful to me. And at this time, 
I can be nothing but faithful to him. So they took Polycarp and they tied him to a stake and they put all the branches and all the stuff around and they set it on fire and a whole crowd of people come to watch this Baptist preacher Polycarp burn to death. But there was a problem. He didn't burn. And he began to preach. And the fires were coming up, but Polycarp's not burning. Remember, John, they dipped in boiling oil and he didn't boil. Amen? And so Polycarp is preaching and preaching and preaching. And the Caesar guts, the emperor guts, furious and commands one of his soldiers to run a spear through the side of Polycarp, whereupon he died and then was burned up. And several people in that attendance got saved through the preaching of that old preacher, Polycarp. This is our history. These are our people. A man named Tertullian, which is referred to as one of the church fathers, Tertullian made the statement in, oh, about 190, 195 A.D., he made this statement. He said, if the Christians were taken out of Rome, out of the Roman Empire, Rome would lose half of her people. It's huge. Christianity. The more they persecuted, the more it spread. The more it happened. This is our past. This is our history. This is who we are. This is how we got to where we are. Some people, young and old, sacrificed their lives to carry the gospel, to carry the word of God, and to keep the commission of the New Testament church so that you could be saved. We owe them everything. They were great, great people and simple people just like us who would not back down from their faith and their beliefs. But now a problem's coming. In 250 A.D., the church at Rome was without a pastor. There were two men that were being considered to be the pastor. Both of them had been deacons within the church. One was a man named Clement. Now, you've got to be careful because there's a lot of Clements. Some of them were very good. Some of them did some writings. Or, and one of them is referred to as one of the church fathers, quote, unquote. And the other man was named Novation. Novation had a problem with what was going on in the church. You see, when persecution would come, a lot of the people would leave the church and go back to their pagan worships. And then when the new emperor would come along and he wouldn't persecute, then they would come back and worship with the Christians and renew their membership in the church at Rome. And as far as novation was concerned, they weren't saved. It wasn't right. That, that shouldn't be done. And you know what? I agree with him. I really do. But Clement believed it was okay. Now, here's the problem. There were more of them than there was with novation. So... Guess who became the pastor? Clement became the pastor. Novation wrote a letter. I read the letter. I, it, it's, it's a long, long letter. I mean, it covers many, many pages. And sent it to the church, removing himself from the church and feeling that the church had apostatized. He sent this letter to the churches in Asia, northern Africa, and also throughout Europe. And many of the churches agreed with him and said, he's right, he's right. He left the church at Rome, and a group of people left with him. They started a church. And Clement, to keep the people that he had with him, took the pagan deities, Jupiter, Mars, and he gave them Christian names. Mercury, he called Paul, and he gave them Christian names, and he held on to them, and there is where your Catholic church started, right there. It started right there, and it began to creep forward, and Constantine, in 
313 A.D. had this great vision of the cross of Christ. And Constantine was in real trouble. The eastern part of the Roman Empire was going against him. And Constantine was losing. So he had this great vision of the cross and Christ leading him on so he could get the Christians to fight with him, to be on his side. Ultimately, the empire was divided. Constantine kept the Roman part of the empire, not the eastern part of the empire. And Constantine became a part of this new, this church. And they called it the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And there you are. That's the start. But there is so much more. There are so many great things. There's so much fantastic stuff that will come along in the centuries. Tomorrow night, I want to deal with the dark ages. And some of this stuff is, it, it's so, it, it's, it's sad, but it's hilarious when, when you hear it. We'll deal with the dark ages. And then Saturday night, we will deal with the Reformation and what happened with the Reformation, all the things. And then Sunday night, We'll deal with America, the coming to America, and what that was all about, and what took place. And just a, a little hint on the, oh, the, Amer the American side I love. I could go on for months on the American side and what took place on the American side. Do you know that the Revolutionary War was the first time Baptists took up arms against their own government? First time. We had never done that before. It's, our history is fantastic, but it's written in blood. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that is true. Because at the time of 313, you'll find that uh, it, was un it, it, it had, was under the authority of a uh, bishop. Uh, by 750 A.D., you have your first pope, and then the pope became basically the ruler over the army and became a political situation. We'll get into that when the Dark Ages. We'll look at how it morphed into what it was. Uh, it is a religious institution, but it is extremely political. Hugely political, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, and some of the things that I'm going to share with you about what goes on in the Dark Ages, you look at it and you say, you got to be kidding me. They actually did this, and they, it's wild. It's, some of it's absolutely wild. And uh, um, any other questions? Any other questions? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes. I will. The word build means to build up. It does not mean to start. It means to build up. Yeah, the will. And that's what he's going to do. That's exactly what he did. So what did he do? He taught them, edified them. He raised them up so that these men would be ready to go into all the world and carry the gospel. Because they weren't ready back then. Not in Matthew 16. In fact, a few verses later on, what does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Uh, Peter's not ready. And it's like this, it, the, the same principle. If you stop and think about it, um, when, I, when I was a young man, I'd surrender to preach. Oh, I'm surrendered to preach. I'm ready to go in the ministry. No, you're not. You need to be prepared to do what you need to do. And even after Bible college, I wasn't ready. I needed to be prepared. Jesus takes and prepares these men. Matthew 16 takes place about the middle of his ministry on earth, which is approximately three and a half years. He has to prepare those men. He has another year and a half to prepare them to be ready to do what they need to do. So not only locally with that church, but also it can make an application to all the churches that are going to come thereafter. I'm going to build them up. Edify. Um, example, Ephesians chapter 4. There are three things. Jesus said that I, I give unto you uh, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers for what? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints. 
Isn't that what he said? Isn't that what he said? Edify. Build up. You're going to build them up. The word does not mean start in any language. And it is not talking about a future starting of the church. It's a talking about building it up. Any other questions? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's just basic, okay? When I got saved, I was 22. Yeah, 1978, I was 22, okay? You got a lot of growing up to do. Uh, they, I had to be edified, built up. I, had a lot of, I wasn't ready to pastor. I thought I was. My pastor knew I wasn't. And after about five years in the pastorate, I realized he was right, <laughs> and I probably wasn't ready then either. So the idea of to build up, and this is where the argument comes in. And uh, uh, there's one thing I forgot to point out on this. I will build my church. It's okay, oh, it's my church. It's singular, and uh, uh, so therefore it's the church. It's everybody it's in the church that's saved, amen? But that's not true if the church means called out assembly if that's what it means then that's not possible how many know your constitution united states you know your constitution united states okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i know some of it you know I'll preamble that in the constitution it tells us that every man has the right to a trial by jury right right amen you have the right to a trial. so is there a big universal jury out there is there that goes around and, and does all the trials? No, 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 no. That is an abstract term. The concrete here is when Ed goes out and kills somebody and they get 12 men together or 12 people together, then there is the concrete. There's that jury that's going to convict you and send you to prison for the next couple of years because that's all your life is going to go. <laughs> and Dad's saying, thanks a lot. appreciate that. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and this, is, this is what bothers me. This is the thing that bothers me. If you study the English language, you don't need to read the commentaries because the English language will explain. It's simple. It's easy. It's an abstract term. Concrete is a local New Testament church. Or it could be referring to that church that was right there. Either way, but that, those are two very clear explanations without it being a universal invisible church because that defies the definition of the word. Yeah. And the definition of the word, it, 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 you can't do that. It, it's, it's just wrong. Anything else? Any other questions? Anything else? Well, I hope that it's been some help to you tonight. Uh, you have to lay the groundwork of the doctrinal issues because you can't get into what church you're looking at unless you find out which one is the right one. That's where you got to start. And then you go into all this other stuff. And these are the things that you'll see. You're going to look at our history and look what happened. And it is, abs you know, w w as you go through it, you're going to wonder, how in the world did we even survive? But we did. And it's great. Absolutely great. Okay. Any other questions? And I'll backtrack over some of this. I have to because I've forgotten about the Welsh and some of the other things. And there's so many things to cover. Okay. All right. I'll just dismiss in a word of prayer. You want to dismiss or I'll let you do that.